Hi, my name is Hannah Crawford and my pronouns are she, her. Hey there, my name is Simi J. Patoka and my pronouns are they, them. And we are the Dreaming Divas. <laughs> we are a podcast inspired by the Screaming Divas. And it is our goal to create a similar platform from the perspective of young singers. And today we had the pleasure of chatting with Adrian Kachanka, voice teacher at the Royal Conservatory and Glenn Gold School with an active performing career globally. We talked about her journey to stardom, teaching, and the queer identity in the opera world. Hopefully you'll check out the episode, but before we get there, we would like to graciously acknowledge that together we reside, learn, and create on the land of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabewaki, Mississauga, Wendake, Neon, Winsio, and Neutral People. We seek re-indigenization. We stand with the Indigenous community and welcome Indigenous voices on this platform. We are grateful to be working and learning on and about this land. We honor these communities as the traditional stewards of the land. We hope you enjoy. Check it out. Ding! Well, again, Adrian, thank you so much for joining us today. We have been so excited about this for so long. <laughs> me too. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Pleasure. Um, if it's all right with you, we'd like to start with um, our 60 Second Life story, and I should have prepared my timer ahead of time. Um, please feel free to leave in all the good parts. Uh, <laughs> and whenever you are ready, I will hit the timer. Okay. And I have to go for myself. Oh gosh, a 60 a life story. Um, <laughs> I was born in uh, Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, I lived there only till I was like two. We moved to Canada. I was raised in Burlington, um, proud Canadian. Um, and I went to university at Western and U of T. I went to Europe when I was 25. I lived there for nearly 20 years where I started my career. Um, I moved back in 2005, married to Laura. We have a family. Um, I'm now chair of voice at the Glenn Gould School, um, mentoring young artists and working one-on-one um, -on -one and with the opera, the operas that we do. Um, um, my performing is, you know, slowly tapering off. I'll be 60 in the not too distant future, um, but um, just a um, lover of life, nature, music. Um, gosh, this has gone very quickly. I'm near the end. Um, yeah, what else? We've got two cats. Um, yeah, uh, just really thrilled to be here and be speaking to you guys about music and life. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was great. That was I love the, the, the good like five second panic at the beginning of like, how, what do I actually say? Exactly. I kind of thought that maybe it would be questions, but that would take far too much time. Just okay. Great. <laughs> that was awesome. Well, um, obviously, as you mentioned, you are the chair, uh, head of voice at the Glenn Gould School. So I would love to chat a little bit about that. How, when did, when were you appointed that? How long have you been with them? Yeah, so I was appointed, my, my job started officially in May 2019. Um, and I think I got on GGS's radar. Um, and this started, you know, again, I, I, I moved back to Canada in 2005. And I'd say by 2010, um, I was invited by Roxolana Roslak, wonderful um, uh, soprano who, um, you know, taught at GGS for many, many years, decades, and started, was one of the founders of the Glenn Gould School. Uh, Ro Roxolana invited me to come and do a masterclass, and I gave a masterclass every year for, you know, four to five years, um, some one-on-ones, some private lessons, but, but also public masterclasses. So I kind of got to know the students, got to know how the school worked. And then the Dean, um, Jim and Agnesen sort of approached me and said, would I consider this role? And um, I immediately said yes. And I think, you know, in retrospect, we didn't know that COVID was going to hit, but it was so, sort of perfectly, you know, serendipitous that I took this job on um, because things shut down, um, you know, early 2020. And the job has provided me with a, you know, um, um, employment, income, stimulation, uh, a home. So it really, I, I sort of am so grateful that, um, you know, things just worked out the way they did. And we're still grappling with COVID, um, you know, two years later. And, and it's um, hard, you know, um, 
to be uh, in an institution and education, wanting to provide our students with the best, most diverse and exciting opportunities. And yet we just hit these roadblocks like everyone does. Um, and we, we were doing our best. So that's how it came about. And um, yeah, and uh, it's in fact, it's sort of funny, Laura and I, when we moved back, um, I knew, you know, we looked, we were looking for a house and um, I had this sort of grid. Uh, I was in Los Angeles performing and Laura was on here on her own looking for a house. And I said, the grid has to be sort of within these streets in Toronto. And I knew that I, you know, I, my future would maybe be at, let's say U of T or Royal Conservatory. So Laura teaches at U of T, I'm at the Royal Conservatory and our house is about 10 minute walk on Huron Street. In the oh, end. that's great. So it really is. I mean, I think I knew that deep down thinking I'm going to end up here, you know, um, so we, we might as well live close. Right. That's um, awesome. I probably passed you guys at some point or another. <laughs> um, so you uh, you were talking about uh, you went to Western and U of T, and I, I think I'm getting a sense that education is a big part of, uh, of uh, your world. What did you always want to be a teacher? Or did, was that kind of a later in life discovery? You know, I think I think a big part of me did, Simi. I mean, I think I I wanted to perform, and that was a huge uh, driving force, a great ambition. And I thought that if I couldn't perform, if you know, if the cards, if I didn't make it, I would be a high school teacher, and I would put on, I would be the high school music teacher, like putting on a show. And <laughs> I loved, I had such great high school teachers and elementary school teachers that, and we put on shows. We put on shows when I was in grade seven and eight. We did My Fair Lady. Um, what else did we do? Did we do Sound of Music? High School was um, uh, Camelot, you know, so these were proper shows. Mm -hmm. um, this is when high schools had band and orchestra and choirs and more than one choir. And we know now in 2021, 22, this uh, money uh, for arts education, music education is lacking in many a high school. Forget about the elementary schools where you've, you've lost uh, designated music teachers and it's a crying shame. So um, I was so inspired by my teachers that, you know, and, and if I couldn't be in the show, then I'd want to put on a show. And I have to laugh because it's sort of what I do now at GGS, you know, with our operas. Um, I'm not the one putting on the show in terms of directing, but I'm casting and I'm, you know, choosing a conductor and I'm choosing the director. Um, it's a lot of fun and sort of a dream come true. And it's really satisfying. That's awesome. I'm curious, do you... Do you still study with a teacher yourself or, or when, when, if not, when did that end for you? Yeah, very good question. You know, I have uh, studied a great deal and, and, and late in life, you know, I'll, I'll turn 59 in March. So when's the Congratulations. last time? When, thank you. When's the last time I had a proper voice lesson? Um, I've, I've been, I, I do coaching and I've had um, coaching last year, like with various coaches preparing on upcoming repertoire. Um, you know, Laura, um, who's a wonderful mezzo and a teacher, Laura is a built-in teacher and we often work together. Um, That's so cool. <laughs> you know, being married to not only a singer, but a teacher, it can be sometimes problematic and sometimes it works really well, sometimes <laughs> not so much. And we've had moments where it's really in the flow and then other times for whatever reason, I'm like, no, I don't agree with you. My e vowel is just perfect, thank you so much. And it can be kind of like a rear. Um, and we have to just take a beat and go, okay, so, but she is, you know, she, it's, she's a wonderful resource. Um, and I, you know, wonderful ears. I'll often say, come, I'm having difficulty with a, a passage or something. So, you know, um, but I believe in constant study. Um, and it's really interesting, you know, um, singing for all these decades, there are some singers that just are good, like they kind of graduate and they kind of are good to never have a voice lesson. I was not one of those and I've had many. I've lived in many different countries and different cities and I've always found um, people to work with, some proper teachers, more others being coaches. Um, but I have my sort of, um, you know, my two main teachers and those are Mary Morrison, who's still going strong at 95 at U of T and my Viennese teacher, Hilda Tzadek, that died in 2019 at the age of 101. So um, both of these grand dams lived to a ripe old age. And it was another, you know, sort of uh, realization um, or observation I made. And I'd sort of say to Laura, what is the key to the longevity of these two women teaching into their 90s, if not 100? And the answer is I th working with young people. 
making music um, and keeping involved. And and when you have, you know, with Mary, she if she's working with a 24 year old, that's, you know, enlivening her and stimulating her um, cu curiosity. She's always been so curious and still, oh, well, let's look at that, dear. She's just wonderful. So I had these great mentors, these great examples of how to teach. Um, and to be honest, and I say this um, humbly, I haven't taught for all that long. You know, um, I taught here and there. If I was in Madrid and someone came up and said, oh, could I have a lesson? I, I did a lot of that kind of teaching. Or if I was here in town, there might be a singer that came over to the house on occasion, but it was often very sort of ad hoc. And I'm just building up my teaching chops now of day in, you know, week by week. I've got my students, I see them, they're doing recitals, I'm getting them ready for all these milestones. And there's beauty to that too. That's incredible. That's, that's super cool. You know, I think I, when I first met you and I've heard about you through um, Jess, who I did a program with, um, that um, I've heard about you and I think I just assumed you've been teaching at universities forever. I think I've just assumed that. And it's actually interesting to hear that you're pretty new to the game, but that, I think that's so exciting too, because you get to even like, even partner practicing with Simi is, is so inspiring just to hear someone else's progress. So I think having that longevity in teaching is super important. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and I think I, you know, and there's to be, and I'll, I'll really be sort of honest here. I think last year, my first year at GGS, I didn't, I was still traveling and performing quite a bit and I didn't have my own students but it started last year and I think I was rather nervous thinking ah you know what if I'm not good and you have to you you learn by doing um you know you cannot just start teaching and know everything pedagogically and just be a genius you need to almost do trial and error you need to be very uh sensitive or um sympathetic to each student their physical makeup their uh, mental you know be very all these components and it's sort of um so these master teachers that have taught for 30 years they do have a wonderful language repertoire um and i'm building on that but i think my um i think it quickly is is um slotting into place and i feel much more confident and i'm getting much more sort of enjoyment and not so nervous thinking oh what am i doing i think ah, i'm figuring it out that's fair that's right. <laughs> That's awesome. But we all are in real reality. We're all just figuring out life. Um, you mentioned Laura, and I was wondering if we could talk about um, being an opera singer who identifies as queer, or in your case, uh, you were saying earlier, lesbian. Uh, did you find that there were any barriers put up because of that, or you had to censor yourself at all throughout your career? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So, I mean, the answer is um, not really. Um, and I, you know, gosh, I came out in the 80s when I was, you know, in my 20s, early 80s, let's say 81, you know, so, um, and, and it was, you know, it was back then, you know, much different than now. Um, and um, I came out to my, my, I suppose, my family and my close friends. Um, and I, however, quickly, I, I moved um, at 25, I moved to Europe and I got hired in Vienna and found myself starting with the Vienna Folk Sopa. Um, and Austria is a very Catholic country, a very conservative country, and I was in this milieu, but I was out to, again, my friends, some of my colleagues. It wasn't like fully out across the board, but I think I, I you know, I was, I suppose, finding my way. And um, I never found that I, to my knowledge, was passed over for a job or that I was shunned by a, by a conductor or a composer or a director. Um, I think I, you know, I, I can recall, uh, this was probably 2001, maybe 2002. I came back and did a concert at Massey Hall. I sang Four Last Songs and Brahms Requiem. It was a lovely concert in June. And I was interviewed, I think, by the Globe, Globe and Mail. Um, and the reporter came and interviewed me and sort of said, oh, well, tell me about your personal life. And so this was, you know, how old was I then? I was, you know, um, I suppose 30 something and I still didn't feel fully comfortable to say yes me and my female my girlfriend and I said oh I, I've, I've got a partner I'm very happy but I you know that was sort of it dot 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 mm -hmm. and and then the 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 interviewer the the um the journalist wrote oh you know she's very happy with this guy you know it was definitely sort of a a male thing and that made me sort of cringe that of course it wasn't authentic 
and I wasn't fully transparent. And of course, everyone that knew me would be going like, well, whatever. Um, it was a bit, uh, you know, so I think I learned the lesson. And as of then, I have been absolutely open in interviews across the board, um, speaking about it with pride. You know, and I think I suppose every person has their own comfortable um, uh, level of comfort when to come out, how quickly. And of course, now I think um, the business is changing or, or I shouldn't say the business, no, um, humanity. So you're getting artists coming out um, non-binary, um, queer, um, I'm trans and uh, met with, with respect and dignity. And uh, so this is, it's, it's fantastic to see. That's awesome. That's coming to hear because I will say from my perspective, I'm always worried um, and I've actually been pr very privileged that this hasn't happened to me many times in my life. But that being said, like, I'm always concerned, like, especially if I go over to Europe, because I know it's not quite as evolved in the way of thinking as it is in North America. I'm worried of like, they're going to see like they them next to my name and be like, I don't even know what that means. Like, I don't want to learn something new and have to deal with all of that while I'm trying to like put on this production. So it's calming to hear that it's not as big of an issue as I may be making it out to be in my head. Um, but thank you for sharing that. It's much appreciated. I think you're right. Uh, I'll just pop in quickly. I do yeah. think, sadly, that Europe is behind us, I think, and behind the US. I think in Canada, like yay Canada, I think it's very good that we're um, ahead of the game, that we're more tolerant and more open society. I do, I've spoken to um, some some queer friends, even in Germany and France, and actually their, their sort of lack of understanding about, you know, the emerging trans uh, and bi non-binary community uh, is rather surprising to me. So I think they are. Then you get with German and French, um, the pronouns is problematic. Mm -hmm. um, they, and I don't- They know don't really one, exist, yeah. They don't, and I don't know what one does with that, but you're right, it's all these questions. and. And they are, oh, is it more conservatism? Um, you know, let's just hope that it does uh, become more widely known and accepted. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. And I think like there's nothing wrong with just creating a new word like non-binary. That was a term directed to computer sciences for a very long time. <laughs> and now and now it's turned into something completely different. And um, not that it doesn't still apply to computer sciences. It definitely does. But um, but it, it's, uh, as, as humans evolve, so should the language, I think. And so we're, we're working toward it. It's exciting. Yeah, thank you for speaking on that. So actually, kind of going back towards schooling, um, you did your schooling in Canada, and then you were over in Europe. Was there like a culture shock in terms of how things ran? Any types of technical differences between, between European and North American? You know, yeah, uh, absolutely. So the culture shock, you know, I was, um, um, you know, went over, I got a grant and um, it was called an arts grant B, um, which was $14,000 back in 1988, which probably translate to about 50 grand, I would think in today's money, maybe more. It was a lot of money back then, which allowed me to move to Europe. I, I moved first to London briefly and I studied with uh, Vera Rocha, who was Kiri Ticano's teacher. Um, and a great musician and a good friend of Georg Schulte's and who kind of hooked me up and, and I performed with Schulte, which was amazing. So I was in London, but I quickly did competitions and won a few and that just opened the, the floodgates and an agent was very emphatic that I come to Vienna and audition. And I did and sort of the rest is history. I got hired on the spot, found myself going, okay, moving to Vienna. Um, you know, really it could have been Karlsruhe, it could have been um, Basel, but it happened to be Vienna. Uh, which is such an important musical center. And I'm so grateful and pleased that that was my fate. But as I say, um, you know, Vienna back in the 80s, um, it was not as, right now it's a very cosmopolitan city. Most people speak English, it's open, it's more progressive. Back then it was very kind of towards the sort of still Eastern European, um, uh, I remember sort of people wearing their traditional Austrian dress like same lady would take her cane and say, you know, um, you've got a string hanging from your 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 coat, like like really kind of just like okay, like just very. Um, it felt daunting and dark, and I didn't, you know, I I had studied German in high school and university, but it didn't give me uh, preparation for the Viennese accent and dialogue, uh, dialect which is strong, 
and like incomprehensible. And I was thrust into work rehearsals um, where, you know, it was German, which was in a way good that I just had to get with the program and learn it quickly. Uh, but I went home in tears a lot. They were hard, they were cruel. I was told, you know, I can't move. Uh, I was cast in an operetta. One of my big first things was being cast, uh, the roles called Laura in Der Bettelstudent, the student, the student, Bettelstudent, the student beggar by a guy called Karl Milliker. And again, people think, oh, operetta, easy peasy. It was tough, high seas all over the place. You had to dance and sing and then waltz around and act. And I had to sort of memorize the dialogue. I didn't know kind of what I was saying half the time. And they were really like, sort of, you know, you, you, you move terribly and your German is atrocious. And it was, it was hard. Um, it, I developed a thick skin. Um, I had visits from, from colleagues, like, you know, classmates of mine that thought, okay, Adrian's over there. Let's go stay with her and let's audition. And maybe we'll also get a gig. And a few of them came over and sort of, Took, took a look around and, you know, just thought they went home. It was out of their comfort zone, the transit system, the language, the, the whole way it worked. And they just felt, you know, that that was one step too, too foreign. Um, I always knew I wanted to go to Europe. It's why I took German and I took French. I think I knew that I wanted to get out of Canada um, and, and go to Europe. It appealed to me and I'm, I'm so grateful that I did that. And I often tell young singers, go to Europe, where of course, we know every 100 kilometers, there's often an opera house. Um, there's much more going on. There's many more theaters and, and festivals. Um, so I do often promote that, but it was, it was not just a, a walk in the park. And I suppose maybe everyone has to, you know, pay their dues, um, build a thick skin. You know, it's sort of a part of being an artist maybe. Um, uh, it's not these things that we look at the television programs, whatever they called American Idol or, you know, whatever people just want fame. They want to be the three tenors or, or I don't know who those are fairy tales. It's a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of rejection. Um, I don't want to be doom and gloom. Um, it's a lot of, of course, reward, but you do have to just do the work, discipline, hard work, show up. Um, so I think I'm, I'm blethering on here. Um, so in terms of, <laughs> technique and stuff, uh, I quickly found this wonderful teacher to guide me in Vienna. Um, and the technique was not dissimilar, you know, in terms of vocal technique. It was just sort of bel canto, good breathing. Um, you know, I was exposed to more uh, Germanic um, composers and works than I would have been here. You know, um, they don't do much Wagner um, in Canada. And of course I was exposed to at the state opera, a lot more Strauss and Wagner, which was wonderful, which ended up being my bread and butter. It's interesting though. I know Simi and I have talked about this a lot and especially being kind of that gray area from finishing university and into either like, do I go for my master's? Do I go to Europe? Do I, what, which, which way do I go? And it's, it's a huge step, but I think it's nice that to hear from someone who's done it already too, that it's, it feels a little more calming. Like I know, like, I know that if Simi goes to Europe, they have a, a incredibly thick skin. I know they're going to, they're going to make it myself. Who knows? <laughs> but then yeah. the likelihood of Hannah going is higher. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'd, I'd sort of say one thing again, you know, I'm, I, I'm, you know, basically I'm, I've sung for 33 years. So when I launched myself, the business was totally different. And it was always sort of said, go over to Europe, go in the fall, do your audition tour and you'll get a job somewhere. And pretty well, yeah, if you sang fairly decently, you would get a job in a fest house somewhere. A, B, and C, A being the top, you know, B being pretty, you know, a fine house, and then C, smaller, smaller German center, you'd get a job, which was wonderful. Now, a job at a C house in Germany is so contested and fought over by many very fine soprani, tenors, whomever, that are being paid, you know, I don't know, 2,000 euros net per month, so that the, it's really difficult to get those jobs that were plentiful. And I think there's a few reasons. Uh, Eastern Europe has opened up. You've got great singers from Kazakhstan, from Romania, from Bulgaria, from the Far East, White Russia, Russia. And the Far East has opened up with Korea, 
um, with such great singers from Korea, Japan, and China. And they are the new superpowers, you know, um, in the game. So there's just all that much more competition. But I'd also like to address this idea of masters. So when I, I didn't do a masters. Well, I did the opera school, which was, I guess, kind of like a, you know, a, a graduate degree. I did my undergrad at Western and then three years, uh, which was called the opera school, where I got an opera diploma. Um, nowadays, I think students that go to do an undergrad and then they do the opera program often then need to do yet another thing. They often find themselves wanting to or having to do a master's, um, a gap year of some sort or a yap. And these young artist programs, when I was young, they didn't really exist. And I think that it's a double-edged sword. I think they can be wonderful, but it can be yet another holding tank, I find, for artists to just again be, um, they get, I guess, a bit of money and they get a fee, but they're kind of not, you know, released. And so at 25, I was singing Countess, First Lady, Magic Flute. At uh, 26, I was doing Tatiana, Freischutz. You know, I was singing the major repertoire, Don Elvira, Don Giovanni, at 26. And there's no reason, in my opinion, why sopranos of that age or tenors cannot. And I think the trend, oh no, you must do a yap. You must maybe wait until your late 20s. And I think that's um, unfortunate for you young singers, um, that everything seems to be delayed. And now this, this is even without COVID. COVID, of course, has added another layer of what are we going to do? What are, you know, how do we keep you know, we're treading water, we're waiting for a break, and we think things are opening up. No, not yet. And I really, my heart goes out for you, um, you know, that are ready to launch. And it's like, oh, very difficult. You know, it's interesting you're talking about singing Countess and Donna Anna Elvira at 26 it feels unfathomable to me. <laughs> um, and from someone who is singing that repertoire currently, I'm 24, turning 25 in September. And it's interesting. Do you ever feel like you sang too big too soon? Or did you have like pressures anywhere? Because I know countless people have told me, don't sing this yet. Don't do that yet. Don't do this yet. I mean, it's, I mean, every different voice is not always correct, of course. But did you ever feel like you s jumped into big repertoire too early? Um, I think initially, Hannah, no, I was, I was very lucky um, at the Volksoper, you know, um, and then later at the, st the State Opera, which I joined in, uh, after two years at the Volksoper, I sort of switched to the big, the State Opera, and the coaches and conductors are so fine and so attuned that they really did kind of, so yeah, my first role was Esther Dama, First Lady, which was appropriate, um, I guess I did Countess next, and then I think, what was it, Don Elvira? I didn't do Anna until a bit later. I started with Elvira. And I was, you know, coached and um, cared for by wonderful coaches that, you know, I would show up, they would take me through it. And so um, they, I felt they had my back. Um, I might have been, I might have benefited. I think some of my colleagues, maybe in, let's say, the Subretfach or um kind of a, a more general baritone fach they had to do more and they might have had more performances with small roles maybe they were singing tuesday thursday friday and sunday where i might have sung tuesday and saturday and i didn't feel overstretched um the beauty of a fest position is when you're ill you know you just call in and say you know i've been to the doctor and i've got uh, an infection and they just say, okay, take care. You're not penalized. You don't lose money. You that you know. So it's an. It was the nice. I was able to develop. So um, I, there might be other singers who sort of say, oh no. And I think the beauty of being in Vienna was that it was a bigger pool of people. Had I started in, let's say, Gießen, a small city outside Frankfurt, which is a small, I, I call it probably a C house between a B and a C. They might have said, Adrian, you've got to do start with Estadama, and then we want you to do Michaela very soon. And then then we need you to look at, um, oh, I don't know, you know, maybe even like Madame a Butterfly. And that would have been, oh, that would have been a stretch. But maybe these singers feel that they can't say no. And then you're in trouble. Yeah, I think that's always something I've been thinking about, too, at going into this career now, being out of school is you, you have to you have to be able to vouch for yourself. And I think a lot of the time, especially in in companies that are really big in commercializing things, 
might try to pressure you into singing things that maybe aren't you aren't quite ready for you haven't studied long enough and stuff but I've always been told like it's like by Leslie too my Leslie Fagan always been like you have to vouch for yourself first so if you if you feel comfortable singing it you should do it but don't let someone try to make you do it no, no. and I'd say it's always great to have a team so you've got yourself and you're that 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 is number one how does it feel to me um, in the practice room alone but then your teacher then maybe a trusted coach um, uh, you know, an agent would be the fourth level, but those are your team and you bounce those ideas off um, the teacher. The teacher might be, well, I think you can do it, you know, so yes, uh, but trusting yourself is paramount. Uh, since since you spent so much time over uh, in, in German world, I was wondering if um, you had any thoughts or opinions on the German Fox system. Do you hate it? Do you love it? Any things that you would probably change if it were up to you? Um, gosh, yes, it is a system, isn't it? I mean, I, um, I think it can be a bit of um, labeling, um, which can be detrimental, that if a singer is labeled as a, um, oh, you know, what do I, Jugendlich Dramatische, um, but then maybe she rethinks and thinks, well, actually, no, I'm not yet. I'm actually just more of a lyric. I'm not a young lyric. Then people, oh, no, you're, you've been in that box and you must stay there, if not develop into a Hochdramatische, you know, a, a, a full dramatic soprano. Um, but of course, it was developed, you know, with, with, with you know, reason in mind, uh, where people did develop, and you might get a lyric tenor that then might become a middle, um, sort of a middle of the road tenor that might grow into a Helden tenor, and things did progress. Um, I suppose my classifications were lyric into perhaps, you know, Jugendlich um, Dramatisch, a young dramatic in my more sort of uh, bigger roles of Strauss, uh, Strauss and Wagner, but I definitely started lyrically um, with, with Mozart and um, these kind of things. So I don't have a problem. Um, I'm curious, Simi, do you find that, you know, young singers are sort of saying, you know, they, they'd like it banned because it isn't fair and they feel boxed in? I would say, um, I'm gonna speak from my perspective because I know that there are people that also disagree with how I see it. I, I think it's a really good way of kind of, of, of the spectrum, kind of finding the part of the spectrum you fit into. But like you were saying, it's, it's, it is a labeling system. And so I've been labeled as like potentially a lyric. And then some people are thinking, I think you'll grow into a dramatic, things like that. Um, and I don't know if I agree with either of those things because I'm, I'm still growing. I'm still so young. My voice is going to change. Um, and, and there are some things in my voice that I'm very sure in, like the coloratura, I'm like, yeah, wherever I fall, that's going to be part of me. I know that. Uh, and so that being said, I think it's it's nice to know around where I can fall so I know what stuff I should try singing, see if it works, see if it doesn't. But I've had people say, no, you're going to be singing this stuff. And I feel like I've tried some of it, hasn't really worked, and maybe it will later but right now it doesn't and I'm gonna sing what feels good for me right now. And so I feel like there are a lot of people that feel when someone says, you're gonna be this, or you're going to be singing these things. Oh, that's yes. no, really that's limiting. That's, that's like, you know, crystal ball and that, that's never good to lock in. And, you know, um, you know, Hannah, you're going to be an Aida one day. Well, okay, maybe, but you know, who says? It's, yeah, bare, exactly. it's bizarre, no. Um, and sing what feels comfortable. I love that you say, I love coloratura. That's just in my voice. That's part of me. Great. And that can have all sorts of colors and, and gradations from, you know, maybe not necessarily hoax dramatic, but the, you know, the higher coloratura into the lyric and, and um, whether it's Handel or Rossini and, you know, a lot of great repertoire. Absolutely. Rossini is my boy. Love that guy. Okay. <laughs> He's not my boy. See yeah, it's true. I know. Same here. I'm like the bel canto guys. That's good. <laughs> that's about it. Yeah. So you've had a huge performing career, which is so, so inspiring to have seen when we first started talking to you. And of course, like we Googled the heck out of you and looking through all your information. I was like, that's so crazy. And the thing that always comes to mind to me is how do you feel about when you make a mistake on the stage? Is there something, do you approach it a certain way? If you, you made a mistake, do you play it off a certain way? Like, what would you, what do you usually do? Interesting. And, and you mean by mistake, um, you know, specifically a, a technical vo vocal thing or just even a staging thing? I think either. I, they're two very separate ideas. Yeah. Maybe both. 
How about? <laughs> I mean, I, I suppose I, I think what you need to do is treat yourself with compassion. I mean, we are human beings, and and if it, you know if a note comes off less than perfectly, uh, whether it's a pitch issue, whether it's a crack, whether it's a kind of misguided um, cadenza at the end, you know, it it is a drag, especially now in the day of I suppose recordings and 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 all this stuff online, and it's there, you know, in my day, um, you know. We didn't have YouTube, you know, so all this stuff is new that you can just Google anyone on YouTube. And I've seen posts of actually where people are highlighting the mistakes that, you know, you'll get an artist and say, look at this person bomb their cadenza. I mean, just the cruelty and the 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 cruelty, you know, um, is just quite shocking. Um, I've noticed in a lot of performances, you'll say comments turned off. And I'm assuming it's because people are snarky going, oh, she really sucked on that. You know, it's it's a cruel business. Um, and I think the more that we can say, um, you know, if and I think you guys would agree, if you go see a performer and they are having an off night or whatever, our hearts go out to them. And it, in fact, endears us to that person. Um, you know, and um, so there's this, you know, it's quickly forgotten or forgiven. Um, it's a part of life. Um, and yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> I always found that I have, I have a terrible poker face. I, I remember I was watching, what was I watching the other day? I think I was watching one of the clips I recorded for something and I had made, I made a little mistake and my face was just immediately like, uh. <laughs> I was like, that, I need to work on that. <laughs> that's true yeah you don't want to telegraph it i mean if you do have to if you do something just carry on in good faith and and just smile through it and and i think a lot of the times people will say i didn't i didn't know i didn't notice that i didn't notice what you're talking about it it sounded perfect to me we're much harder on ourselves we've got the ears and the judgment and this whole idea of perfection you know um it's often not a big thing we, we talked a little bit about uh, the, the changes of the industry between North America and Europe and all those things. I'm curious, as the, the classical music industry as a whole, or maybe specifically opera, what do you think you want to see change in the industry? Oh, it's a big, important question. Um, I want to see more um, diversity and inclusion. You know, I think that I think that the past couple of years, you know, during COVID, what we've seen, the Me Too movement, um, the... Um, 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 black, you know, the, all these movements rising up, um, LGBTQ, and so I want our opera companies and our schools to reflect that in terms of casting um, in the pieces uh, that they're choosing and programming, uh, the casting of those said um, artists and directors and um, orchestral members and um, composers, you know, um, uh, female composers, people of color, composers of color. Um, and also new works. I do think it's time to, you know, I, I, I sort of, you know, we programmed Svadba, we did that you two attended, of course, um, luckily in November, because we were open. And that was such a wonderful, uplifting uh, production. Now, Svadba isn't that new. I mean, Anna Sokolovic wrote it in 2011. But it feels very fresh. And compared to many of the things, it is rather new. So I welcome completely new works or relatively new works, works by females works by you know diverse backgrounds um because it really is the way forward and if we look at you know um the the recent things from tapestry opera you know companies that i admire tapestry against the grain whether it's their messiah plus or i'm getting the names wrong but all of these the uh the things that they've been doing um are very exciting and innovative and uplifting and have great beauty so um I do think, and you know, maybe I'm sort of speaking to the big companies, the big established companies, changing it up. Um, I think really is needs to be done, and you know, we can't, you know, fall back on the maybe just the Barber of Seville's, followed by the, you know, this this um, the white man's canon, as we call it, that does need a shake up, and um, yeah, that's my that's my answer. Sort of really just shaking things up needs to be done. Yeah, I, I, I must say that I know Hannah and I were in complete and utter shock after uh, Svadba. We were like, how revolutionary to have like a primarily a cappella opera, first of all. And then the story was like something so familiar as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was it was it was very interesting to see something that was so relatable, yeah. even though it wasn't like I know all of these old operas can be very relatable to today's society as well. This was like so fresh and real and and 
Um, the singers were absolutely fantastic. Hannah and I still rave about it. <laughs> yeah, and I think we were lucky, and I, I think Anna, um, who sadly couldn't be um, to come to Toronto for the production, but she was very touched by the casting. You know, we cast, these were students, so these were very young um, singers that we had. And I know other production of Spot, but they've had older singers, which is fine. But I think probably back in Serbia, this is sort of from these, um, you know, almost more of this, you know, folk tradition. I think, you know, the, the um, what was her name? Um, Milena, I should know the name, uh, Milica. Mil the character of Milica was probably sort of a 16 year old, uh, maybe 17, you know, going off to be married um, with her friends. You know, it's bittersweet. It's the joy of the, her new chapter and the joy to be joined, you know, to her, her partner and the sadness leaving her friends and their sadness. I, you know, get goosebumps thinking about it. It was so nice to have these young, um, young women playing these roles. So it was a, it was a real highlight. We don't know what's to come, you know, fingers crossed. We're working on our, our spring opera. We're still going ahead with the hopes, but we shall see. Um, so Spadba will really be a beacon um, for this whole year. It stands really up there. Absolutely. And I know when I know when I went to see it, like it was, it was so, it was just amazing to watch again. And I think after so, all this COVID stuff and being closed and not having all these opportunities, seeing it was like, it really ignited the passion again for us, I think too. And it's, especially with that relatable story, like whether or not you're moving away to be with a partner or whatever, it's change and change is scary. And it's hard to leave your friends and it's hard to leave what you know, but it's so important to develop you as a person. And I, and I love that I think it was sort of the voice was front and center. We didn't need the orchestra. Um, and it was also very female, of course, just six female singers. So it was like the female voice just here, you know, coming at you, you know, big, mm -hmm. larger than life. And it was just overwhelming. And all the amazing ways the voice was used, not just in singing, but in those rhythmic um, gibberish sounds and clicks and moans. And it was just extraordinary. Was such a joy. Truly, I, I remember um, during the show and it was partially the singers and the space and afterward Hannah and I were like, it was a little bit deafening at times, but we were ha like, we were like, please deafen me, please yeah. deafen me with these sounds. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and afterward we were like, I can't wait to go practice now. Like, can we go home yeah. and practice? Yeah. Yeah. That's the best thing. And I often do, I'll often like watch, whether it's on YouTube or see a, a, you know, a live production and be so inspired by what I've just seen that I need to get to the practice room to kind exactly. of try out what I just witnessed. Oh, I saw that person doing such and such. I'm going to try that. It's so wonderful, you know? Mm -hmm. So Agreed. true. Um, Adrian, I'm, I'm very curious. This is not a question I prepared, but you have sung and worked alongside some really impressive names over the years. Yours, of course, is one of them. I'm curious, was is there anybody who was like a really big deal for you to meet and work with? Oh, well, there have been, yeah, I suppose there have been a few, like, um, I think my association with Placido, um, I've sung with Placido several times, um, he's conducted me several times, and he's been my, you know, he's played my father uh, um, in Simon Bocanegra at the Met, um, we sang Valkyrie together, we've sung Queen of Spades, Peak Dam at the Metropolitan, um, what else, maybe other things, um, and, um, you know, Placido's um, uh, reputation has been, you know, um, under scrutiny of late. And um, I don't necessarily want to, we don't need to get into that. But he's someone at the time, if I can just speak of when those performances happened, that was a big deal. And um, he was always, you know, quite a lovely, um, you know, colleague. Um, I've sung with Jonas Kaufman. I've sung with... Um, uh, let's see, Adita Grubarova. Um, and, you know, the, these stars, these mega stars, you know, whether it's, you know, Jonas or Adita, um, you know, Hildegard Barons, uh, Krista Ludwig that I have sung with. And this is this is back in the day, those, those stars like Ludwig and Barons. You know, I find that the rule is the bigger the star is, the more natural they are. You know, they're not the ones that are kind of, you know, get me, you know, I think there's always an exception. Um, but often these great stars are the ones that are sort of saying, hey, how's it going to the tech staff, to the makeup people, that they're often very generous and kind um, and, and not unapproachable. Now, in terms of conductors, I've worked with some giants, you know, sadly, many of them are no longer here, like Abado, like uh, Schulte, um, 
Neville Mariner, uh, Colin Davis, um, you know, some greats. Um, and that was, you know, was I daunted? I suppose I was. Um, I worked with Ricardo Muti several times and he was daunting because he's a force and he's very, uh, you know, he's um, just got this sort of aura, you know, aura, aura about him, which is very sort of that Italian sort of leader slash dictator, if you will, but, you know, um, which was off-putting, but he was again, a gentle giant. He worked with me very generously when I did my first Don Anna with him in Vienna, he sort of said, we, you know, come, come to my studio. And he worked on the coloratura like a voice teacher. Yada, da, 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 no, no, try it again. Take your breath, let's do it again, on again. And he just worked and worked with me, which was extraordinary. And these things don't happen today. The conductors don't have time. They are flying from Berlin to Kiev to San Francisco. They don't take the time or there's not it. There's not the time, which is sad. So to have those experience, I feel great, you know, really grateful. And, um, but again, you know, it's, um, you know, whether it's Baron Boehm or, or all these, these, these geniuses, you know, you just, as a musicians, you come together and, and, uh, if you are starstruck, you get over it pretty quickly because they're going like this and you have to just do it, you know, and musicians are known to be collegial and fun and pretty friendly. And, and usually then it, it, there's some laughs and some, some friendliness. So, um, yeah, uh, those are my stories. I mean, maybe I'm forgetting people, but, um, so yeah. cool. That's so cool. Wow. <laughs> Hannah and I, I could watch Hannah's face and we were both like, what? <laughs> I know, and then, you know, young people, Erin Morley, who I just adore, Isabel Leonard, um, um, Garancha, Ellen, you know, Elena, mm -hmm. um, Nina Stemma, you know, like, yeah, these, these are just, and they're all very, you know, down to earth, kind, nice people. It's so interesting, too, because like, I don't know, I don't know about you, Simi, but these are names that I listen to for repertoire that I'm trying to learn. You know what I mean? And it's crazy to talk to someone who's like, see, like touched their body, you know, <laughs> who's been in their presence. <laughs> well, it's also so interesting because we have one with us right now. I know. I, I listen to Adrian's things when I'm trying to learn some too. stuff too, especially any like Strauss stuff. I'm like, hello. hello. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, you guys are great. This is really fun. <laughs> Hannah, did, uh, did you have anything else before the last question? I don't think so. You take it. I can take it. Oh, oh yeah. my gosh, I'm getting all the fun questions. <laughs> um, so before we go into rapid fire and all the craziness that ensues, we always like to ask your why. Why do you wake up and teach and sing and perform? What is your why? And I would love to hear. You know what? And I found this out during COVID. I have to, I do it for my, I do it because I want to do it. It's, it's sort of, it keeps me sane. And I kind of liken it to be an athlete. If I was, let's say, a professional skater or, or, or swimmer that then retired or wasn't doing it very much, I still would need to get in the pool and do my laps. I still, if I'm having a bad day, nothing turns it around quicker than going and singing through some beloved repertoire or singing scales. I just sing scales. It makes me happy. I need to sing. I need to exercise my voice. Maybe you can liken it to a, a racehorse that needs to get out there and run. And I'm not saying I'm the racehorse. It's just, I'm a horse. And doing that physical thing does make me happier. Um, I'm never stopping uh, tinkering. I got the mirror out. I'm looking at myself. I'm recording. It never stops. And I think it never stopped again for these older teachers of mine. Um, so I'm just, I just love it. When I often talk to Laura, Laura is a, uh, passionate about ceramics and during COVID she bought a kiln and she's down in our basement making these wonderful she's a very gifted ceramicist and that's her passion and she sort of often says well what are, you know what are you gonna like what's your you know you need a hobby or you need a a new thing and I'm like no no just the old thing I'll do my singing and, and my teaching it's enough and it's very, it really feeds me and satisfies me my curiosity so that's it that's my why See, it's Hannah, interesting. I'm not alone. <laughs> I know, it's true, you aren't. It, I think it, just, it it depends on the person. I mean, of course, I, I love singing too. I, I, to be honest, do I have any hobbies? No. <laughs> <laughs> I just procrastinate. Anyways, that's beside the point. I was going to say, it's funny that you mentioned that Laura does ceramics because I've met so many opera singers who have turned to pottery in the last <laughs> couple years. Like, many. <laughs> 
Well, tell me. Well, it's so it's so organic and it's physical and it's satisfying and you know it's a wonderful. I'm not surprised. I mean, we know that people are turning to you know sourdough making anything that yeah. is, that is creating and and it's that's why we bake and that's why we are knitting and doing these things because we need to yeah we need to create. Absolutely, wow. Um, if if you have time in your schedule, we'd love to do a rapid fire with you. Yeah, I do. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. All right. Um, rapid fire. Just the first thing that comes to your mind. Uh, they're very easy questions. Hopefully we didn't make anything too complicated for you. I think so. Um, what is your favorite Toronto spot, bar or restaurant or anything along those lines? Gosh. Um, probably some park in the annex, like Sibelius Park, which is near us. It's a beautiful park where, you know, tree, beautiful old trees and children playing and people hanging out that's cool awesome. um oh uh what's your favorite city you've been to so far oh gosh it's a it's a toss-up um i'd have to say munich mm. munich or vienna put vienna in sort of, sort of vienna munich and or vienna <laughs> <laughs> um what is the most recent thing you have learned the trumpet I got a trumpet for less um, for my birthday, and um, I'm learning the trumpet. And I'm I need I desperately need a teacher. So maybe someone that'll see this thing will say, okay, I can teach your trumpet. But yeah, I got a thing thinking I want to learn the trumpet. A bit about again technique and figuring it out, and it's fun. That's so, so cool. <laughs> um, who is your opera singer crush? Probably, you know, maybe Brigitte Fassbender in the day, back in the day when she was singing Octavian in these pant roles. Yeah. Or good one. Anne Sophie von Otter singing those, again, those those wonderful medzi singing those boy roles. Mm -hmm. Speaking my language now. What is your party trick? Gosh, party trick. Um, um, gosh, I, I'm not very good at these sort of things. Um, <laughs> We can skip. It's okay. Yeah, maybe playing the trumpet a little bit. There you go. That's a good party trick. Yeah, it's okay. It's true. Um, oh, I love this one. Um, the best advice for a young singer. Keep being curious. Keep. Uh, exploring, keep at it, sort of keep on keeping on, um, dis you know, d d just discipline and, and devotion, keep at it, but be curious about it. What composer would you like to speak to from any era? Verdi. Me too. Yeah. That's a good one. And it's it's interesting. It's you know because the, the first two it would be well Mozart too. Strauss and Wagner were so present, but but Verdi as well. But I just am such a um, yeah. It'd have to be Verdi. I'm reading his uh, uh, biography, which is this big tome on my bedside. Fascinating. Um, so yeah, Verdi. He's had quite the life, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, this is a good segue. What's your favorite composer to sing? <sighs> I'd probably say Richard Strauss. Yeah. You and Camilla get along very well, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> she loves Strauss. Um, who do you fan person over? Um, in any genre, like in any, you know, or just opera or Meryl right. Streep. Meryl Streep is my big crush. Complete. Really? Oh, total, total. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Love, adore. I'll agree with that one too. I love Meryl Streep. Absolutely. And I, I, and she, I think she came and did something at Kerner Hall. I think she sort of recited some sort of thing recently. And I think I was away. It was like, oh, you know, that was the one time that she was in the city that I could have gone and sort of, hey, Meryl, let's do a selfie. But no, it wasn't <laughs> but I, I adore her. And and I love that she was trained as a singer, you know, has those singer chops when she's doing these musicals and stuff. Such fun. I think you could definitely use your celebrity to meet Meryl Streep. Yeah. I think you could totally do that. You're a pretty big deal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll try. <laughs> Send her an email. Adrian, thank you so. Oh, you have another one. I'm so sorry. How could you forget? This I is our know. favorite question, Simmy. Oh, it is. It is. It is. Okay, we're asking everyone this lately. 
How do you take your bagel? What do you like on your bagel? I like a poppy seed bagel, bit of cream cheese. That's it. Oh, plain and simple. Yeah. That's amazing. I love that. Um, Adrian, thank you so, so much uh, for doing this with us. We were so, so thrilled to be able to talk to you today. I speak on behalf of Hannah as well. <laughs> thank you both. It's my pleasure. I, you know, it's so great to see you young, you young, talented artists, not only singers, but also doing a forum like this. I find that that you young singers are doing, are branching out. And especially during COVID, you, the gigs are not there. So what are we gonna do? Let's do a forum. Let's talk to singers. Let's talk to, to creators and, and really just expanding and, and making connections and networking. So I applaud you both. Wish you all the best and um, let's stay in touch, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You got this. Hi, my name is, oh, fuck off. Sorry. <laughs>